While Miss April's coming to preparing to sing for us, let's take our Bibles and turn to Psalms chapter 8. Psalms chapter 8. We'll read the entire psalm, uh, verses 1 through 9. I had planned to finish up on the Christian armor this Wednesday night, and it's number seven, and it's keeping the lines of communication, praying always with all prayer and supplication. Um, but might have to back that up one, one Wednesday night, and uh, the service will be streamed at, at normal time at seven o'clock, and I'm going to ask one of the men of the church to fill in for me on Wednesday night on that streaming service. And either tomorrow or Tuesday, I'm, I'm going to go up to Ohio with Tammy. Her, her last uncle on her mother's side, Bill, passed away this morning. So um, he was 91, about, about 92, and uh, always was faithful to come to all the family things and uh, her mom's brother. So, uh, Lord, when, I don't know when the service will be. It'll be Tuesday or Wednesday, something like that. But we plan to uh, be up there for that. Psalms chapter 8. Psalms were picked out this morning, such as How Great Thou Art, and we went ahead and started the service with um, God of the Universe because it, it went along with this morning's message. I'm close. Verse 1, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Who has set thy glory above the heavens? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beast of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. We'll come back to this in simple message entitled, uh, I think it was originally, I had giving it careful consideration. Giving careful consideration. So when I consider thy heavens. I'm going to have a lot of little this and that. Trivia, facts, wonderments. Of, of nature in this morning's message. I wish our young people would hear them. I, I don't know how well we did on trivia in Sunday school. Start off with a little bit of sports trivia, start off with a little bit of history trivia, a little bit of uh, m music trivia. You say, well, what was, the, just something fun to start before we get into the lesson on prayer. But So I asked him, what singer called his girlfriend a hound dog? You know. Stuff like that. So you all think, be thinking about that. See if you can get it. Um, what what singer sang? Um, what singer sang that and dreamed about being over the rainbow? You know. So you can be thinking about that one. If you get anything else out of the message, you'll get this introduction about little trivia facts and things like that. What poor mountaineer left West Virginia, moved to California? Now I thought every one of them would get that. But they didn't come and listen to my story about a man named Jed. I don't, can't figure that out. Um, and then also, well, April got it. Uh, and then what, uh, what poor West Virginia Princeton native was stranded three years? Clue? Don't get, ever get on a boat for a three-hour tour called the USMNO, okay? But anyways, there you go. Now be thinking about that all week long. Now, I'm looking. Don't you get your phones out and start Googling them up, okay? We're talking about the Beverly Hillbillies. We're talking about Gilligan's Island. We're talking about Dorothy on the Wizard of Oz. So we don't, I'll just give you answers. This morning, we'll throw some things out that are just little trivia things. 
that when it's done, I hope you'll say, man, how great is our God. Two, and what is man that thou art mindful of him? And three, and the son of man that thou visitest him. I'm coming back to the idea that when you need to, grab a passage of the scriptures and head straight to Jesus. Or head, head to the cross. Let's have a word of prayer this morning. Holy Father, as we come to you in prayer, we ask for your blessings on the servants. For each and every one that's come this way. Even now, Lord, your spirit take the service, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. standing on the mountain holding to the shepherd's hand the valley you just came through was hard to understand then the shepherd draws you closer there's something he wants you to see and he points back to the valley and unfolds its mysteries. As the eagles soar around you and you look back on where you've been, one by one he answers questions that he did not answer then. He now shows you the danger of going your own way. All those roads you thought were better would have led your soul astray. He reminds you of that moment when you could not make it through. Now you see one set of footprints where he reached down and carried you. As your tears fall on his shoulder and you thank him for love he says child I knew that one day you'd see this valley from above things look different on the mountain from the shepherd's point of view standing high above the tribe that he brought you safely through all the valley's disappointments will never look the same to you for things look different on the mountain from the shepherd's point of view all the valley's disappointments will never look the same to you. For things look different on the mountain from the shepherd's point of view. She had to do that with, uh, now we can turn that volume back down. She had to do that with very little background help. 
And uh, I don't, not too many could do that, pull that off. But whatever button is turned off back there that regulates the, the, the tape, we couldn't find it. So something, something was shut off on her this morning. Maybe it's, maybe we can get that figured out. When I look up the word consideration, you probably everyone can get pretty close to it on a working definition themselves, but to consider or consideration is to fix the mind on, to think on with seriousness or give careful examination, to ponder, to study, even to meditate, giving mature thought and deliberation. And I'll just copy that right out of the dictionary. Because I see in chap Psalms chapter 8, verse number 3, when I consider, when I've pondered, when I've given thought to, when I've meditated and given some mature thought and deliberation to the works of thy fingers. I consider this a shepherd's musing. I can see David as a shepherd boy somewhere out in a pasture outside of Bethlehem on a starry night, looking up in the heavens, and through the Holy Spirit, using his situation, using his personality, penning these words. Composing the verses, he gives consideration in verse number three to this simple little outline. Verse three, when I consider the heavens, the works of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, I think he's seeing how majestic God is, the creator. Verse number four, he says, What is man that thou art mindful of him? In comparison, he sees the insignificance of a man or a shepherd boy on a hillside. Verse five, For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor then I think you can see he considers the benevolence of God to man. Recently on Wednesday night, we considered about on the servant's mind where the scripture said, let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus. We had something similar in this basic outline. When it spoke of Jesus, let this mind be in you which was in Christ, also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but took upon him the form of a servant. Being found in the fashion of a servant or man, made himself like unto man, and humbled himself unto death, even the death of the cross. The simple outline was who God was, who Jesus was, in the form of God from all of eternity, and that from the beginning. Then we see what he became. He became humanity. And not only just humanity, but he became humanity that suffered death. And not only just death, but the death of the cross who he was, to what he became, to what he bestowed upon us, and why he did it, that we might become the righteousness of God or Christ in him. So I realize this is similar to that same outline. How majestic God is, how insignificant man is, how benevolent God is to man. When I consider the heavens, Psalms chapter 8 verse 3, the evolutionistic thought in it, in its very simplistic form, it's not new with me, is that everything that exists is the result of a massive explosion, randomly producing the right environment for life. And continuing big bangs are somewhere out there expanding the universe. The first portion based is copied. A result of a massive explosion producing the right environment for life. Yes, yeah, simply called the Big Bang. The revelation of God's word is exactly opposite. I mean 180 degrees. That all things that are, are the result of the creative work of an all-wise, infinite, all-powerful being. It called this universe into existence with a design and a purpose. One is a random accident and one's design and purpose. I read in the scriptures in the beginning, God, the word is Elohim, 
it simply means in Hebrew, all wise or all powerful one. All powerful one. In the beginning, the all powerful one created the heavens and the earth. I realize the conjunction of father and son, that which was from the beginning, reads in John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. I see the father and the son. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 2, it speaks about God in, in former times spoke through prophets, but hath in these last days spoken to us by his son, by whom also he made the world. So there's the evolutionistic thought, a massive explosion producing the right environment in life, random, chaotic, accidental, evolving, or there's revelation from God's word. A, a, an all-wise, an all-powerful creator with design and purpose. David doesn't have the, he doesn't have a microbio, uh, bi, uh, scope, electronic micro, microscope to see the smallest things created. He doesn't have electronic or he doesn't have a telescope. He doesn't have uh, Mount Palmel's uh, telescope, telescope of 10,000 magnifications. Uh, he doesn't have the Hubble spacecraft. He doesn't have uh, satellite imagery. He's a shepherd boy, but I'll tell you what he does have. He has a revelation from God. And with that revelation, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he could look and see such things as what is the most common and significant body in the orbit of, their, of, our, of our earth. He can see the sun. And in the daytime, he can see this celestial body 93 million miles away. He doesn't know it's 93 million miles away. But he knows the course of human nature is the sunrise and the sunset and all the work and the labor of the day and then the, the moon, the lesser light at night. He, he sees that sun. He doesn't know that if the earth on its 22.5% tilt on its axis as it orbits around the sun, he doesn't know that if we were five miles closer, we'd all burn up uh, in the summer. He doesn't know if it was five miles closer that we would all freeze in the winter. He doesn't know that this orbit is that precise of that sun. He doesn't know that the sun is one million times larger than the earth. It's burning at 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit on its surface and unknown in its core. He doesn't know that it's 883 miles across. He doesn't know that a 747, which could, at top speed could, could circle the earth, if it goes top speed, can circle the earth in less than 40 hours. But that same 747 would take six months, day and night, to circle the sun one time. He doesn't know that. He doesn't know that it would take... Well, if you took the earth comparison to the sun, you'd take, it'd be equivalent to taking a 72-passenger yellow school bus and filling it with golf balls. He doesn't know the sun's that much bigger. David's never seen the squeaky or heard the squeaky brakes on a school bus. He relates that. He sees the object at night. He sees the moon. Now, moon on a bright, full night clear night. He doesn't know it's 243,000 miles away. Well, that seems awfully close compared to the sun, 93 million miles. It's only 243,000 miles away. But every planet in our solar system, including Jupiter, could fit between the earth and moon and have room to spare. Saturn's nine times bigger than the earth. Jupiter's 11 times bigger. And yet all of them could be placed in between. Years ago, McDonald's used to advertise that they'd made so many millions of burgers. Then after a while, they started changing their sign. One billion burger served. Well, you know what? <laughs> David doesn't know what a McDonald's burger is, but he didn't know it'd take like 11 billion McDonald's hamburgers to get to the sun or get to the moon. Well, he looks up there and he says, and he realizes he sees other clusters of stars. 
He looks up there and he sees other, seems to be glow, but not any distinct body, but glows in certain regions. From his naked eye, he's just seeing fragments or pieces of the Milky Way galaxy, and that's why it has that glow. He doesn't know that it's 100,000 light years across. He doesn't even know what a light year is because it wasn't until maybe what we considered mo modern physics, we figured out that at the speed of light, 186,200 miles per second, that how far light could travel in one year would be a, a light year, which is just at six trillion miles. Fastest thing David's seen is probably a racing, a racing camel. They called it a dromedary. Fastest thing he's probably seen maybe is a lion running in the wilderness or coyote. Or they're similar to a coyote or wild dog. He has no comprehension of a mile or, or, a, or a light year's worth of miles at six trillion. He doesn't know that that milky substance he sees beyond the sun or beyond the moon at night is 100,000 light years across. Huh. He realized he doesn't know that there's a, another sun in this galaxy called IC1101 that's 50 times the size of our own sun. And yet it's so small, we'll dot out, small little dot out there. The closest galaxy to the Milky Way is another 100,000 light years. I mean, if we could get to the edge of the Milky Way, 100,000 miles, uh, 1,000 light years, there's a, a, a gap or a gulf of black space to the next galaxy of 100,000 light years. And then that's just one of another 200, who doesn't know, they say, 200 to 300,000 more galaxies. Well, these, these numbers are mind-boggling. These are just something you look up on Google Fact Check or Scientific and Wonders of Space. The farthest observable edge to the universe from Hubble, the farthest observable edge, if you want to call it an edge, even this week, we were talking to Brother Ford, he said, how can it have an edge? How can it have a wall? What, what would be on the other, how thick would your wall be? What would the edge be composed of? And what's on the other side of the wall? What's on the other side? Infinite. How do you figure this? But the farthest observed from the Hubble spacecraft is 23 trillion light years away. I throw that number out. And one light year is 6 trillion miles? This is as far as we can observe at this moment? In the sky is 30, and a starry night in the Milky Way galaxy is 30 billion trillion stars between here and the next galaxy. That's a three with 28 zeros. Who counted them? Who's counting them today? How do you figure on something like that? Except to realize that David could look out and see that sun. He could see that moon. He could see some of these stars. And he could say, oh, Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name. He could look up there, when I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, that thou hast ordained, what is man, that thou art mindful of him? The earth is 3.5 million times larger than a six-foot man. The solar system is 36 billion times larger than the earth. Take those numbers and look at David looking at that space and seeing a space backdrop that's 36 times, or 36 billion times bigger than the earth, which is 3.5 billion times bigger than a man, let alone a shepherd boy. And Dave said, how can you make all that and be mindful of me? The shepherd boys all consider man. There's 7.2 billion people on the earth today. Could be a few more, a few less. Even the census workers of West Virginia have found out people know how to hide. Or they move and they can't and you can't find them. 
Well, we found out there was supposed to be a house between my neighbor and the neighbor's house. But as far as I know, since I've lived there, no one's lived in between us. We got, we got every 10 years, we got to find out how many people there are. Do our best to count them. So 7.2 billion, I'm thinking maybe, you know, we might have might missed 100,000 or two here or there. What do you think? When I consider that there's this many people, there have been great ma mathematicians. And when I see the work that they do, I walked in the office when Matthew Ellison was doing some of his finished work for his graduate graduate degree, I know to be a computer tech. And he's working on a math problem that he had the whole desk spread out with papers. He had one computer going over here, his laptop computer going over here, and, and him and his class and a project team, I think of three people, were sitting there trying to figure out one math problem. It's going to take them several days. And I looked down at those numbers and I just said, man, I started in like sixth grade where we had to find X, remember? I, they're still looking for it. They're still looking for it and doing teams of it, and using all kinds of computers to find it. I remember walking down, and the stepmother said, "Now, boys, don't bother your dad for the next couple of days. He was taking his qualification exam to work for NASA, and the United States government, and he's going to figure out how to get spaceships at certain angles, certain places, and different times, and." Whatever, no, like that. And I just remember, and they didn't have all the computerization we had to do. I just know that whole kitchen table was spread out with things, and he had a slide rule over here and a, an old working mechanical ca calculator over here. And for the whole week, he's sitting at that table figuring out how to move a spaceship, I guess move a spaceship from here to there and get it back home. And I just know as a kid looking at, at some of the, what was scribbled and what was written on all those papers, I was in awe. I walked out of the kitchen saying, man, Dad's smart. <laughs> I'll never be able to figure that out. All the great inventions, the things people are coming up with, who would have known, you know, you could, the inventions that have come up in the last hundred years. Somewhere in one of the family houses is some of the rudimentary inventions of Thomas Edison. I remember him sitting on the shelf once at Grandma Smith's house, two little some little trinkets and things that he was just playing around with. It wasn't the phonograph at the time, it wasn't the electric light bulb, it was just other little trinkets and things he'd been working with. He ended up with over a thousand patents, and close to 1,100. Just all the time thinking of something new, and in a better way, another tool. One of the things ladies can be thankful today came along that line is your electric blender. Instead of a mechanic, just all kinds of things. Inventions, mathematicians, <laughs> there's some, been some brilliant things. I think composition, especially in music, I realize how simple our music is, our basic timings are, but I have seen pages of those who maybe, uh, I think a young person when I was in college and had spent some time at Juilliard School of Music and I saw the composition of music they were writing and orchestration and putting all the different instrumentation together for a final. And I looked at, and it was just a page full of a mess of notes, but to him it was, it was math. To him it was, it was beauty. And to him it was, if you sit down at the piano and you start playing and say, this is what the oboe will do, this is what the clarinet will do, this is what the bass clarinet, this is what the French horns will do, chairs one, two, and three, this is what, and, he, and all that compiled down. It was beyond me. But I got an idea. I said, man, that's, that's amazing. And someone can sit down in their head and see all that at one time. That's amazing. Not only compositions that, but even the Compositions, which I didn't appreciate when I was in school, of words, language. Yes, Shakespeare was brilliant. This thought in another, another realm, another degree. All of a sudden, want to want to quote the poem that we we had this morning. My level of poetry. There was a man from Blackheath. He actually sat down on his false teeth. He said with a start, oh my, bless my heart, I've bit myself behind, you know. That's my level. There was a man from Durham who got some new britches and wore them, bent over to laugh, felt a cool draft, knew exactly where he tore them. 
That's my level. And Brittany's, obviously. She's the only one laughing. <laughs> but then I read the words of Tennyson. I read the words of Wordsworth. And I realize people could craft words that could speak God's language. I said, man's pretty smart. But when David compared man to the God who could make this universe, he found out something put man pretty in a in pretty insignificant God who could create this universe and call into existence and put into precise orbits suns and moons and planetary systems and in whole galaxies and move them at 100,000 light years away from each other and move 100,000 light years across from each other and put them in a distinct orbit that we sit down and we set an atomic clock and our watches can be one second precise per year according to the orbit of the of the constellations. Is that an accident? What is man that thou art mindful of him? This kind of gives an idea. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 10. Let's read this passage that we're kind of familiar with, but maybe put it in a different light. Matthew chapter 10, verse 29. Jesus is trying to tell people not to fear or to worry. Boy, I'll tell you what. I'm still reminded of that psalm. There they were in great fear where no fear was. Children of Israel came to a place where they were in great fear. And they didn't realize that the same mighty awesome God who took care of them in the wilderness took care of them in Egypt. And there they were quaking in their boots. And fear not them which kill the body. Well, if someone has that authority, that power... Seems like something ought to fear, but, but are not able to kill the soul. All they can do is harm the body, but not your eternal being. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. There is one awesome power that has the authority over both, the physical and the eternity. But watch what he compares this to. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? Farthing, folks, isn't much. You know, it might be that penny, you know, I put it in today's terminology, or actually it was considered like a mite, maybe one-tenth of a penny. If you see a penny on the ground, do you pick it up? Is it still to you, Benjamin Franklin's, a penny saved is a penny earned? Or is it still, someone dropped a penny, there it lays. And I hope it's not, oh, it's, it's tails, so it's bad luck, I'm going to leave it. A penny's a penny. But if we can compare something that's not even one-tenth of that, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? I'm going to say if you can get two sparrows for a penny, that's one cheap bird. Or you might say worthless bird. The other passage you'll compare this is they are not five sold. It's like, two, it's like a two for two or two for one special. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore. Why shouldn't I fear? <laughs> For you are more value than many sparrows. <laughs> well, thank you very much. But the idea is, not one sparrow falls to the ground. God doesn't know it. And he looks at them as individuals and says, the very hairs of your head are numbered. When I... Consider the heavens and how great they are. What is man that thou art mindful of him? If you see a sparrow fall out there in the, in the woods, I walked in the garage. Man, tell Tammy this. I walked in the garage, and this little bird, as I walked in, he started kind of, I guess me walking in, like, oh, man. And he turned around, and he hightailed it towards the back of the garage and went right into the window, killed himself. I look at that little bird. He was sitting on top of the tool thing where the air compressor is and I looked at him laying there uh, kind of giving out his last breaths you know like that and said yep and God saw that and God saw knew where that sparrow f fell he said don't fear you what, what man can do to you your heavenly father has knowledge of the very hairs on your head does heavenly father realize that 1.4 million Americans are in a U.S. nursing home this morning. 
Does he know that one-fourth of them will not have one visitor this year? Does he know that 7,500, give or take a few, children will go through St. Jude's Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee this year for serious treatments of cancer and brain tumors? Does he realize that in Sao Paulo, Brazil this morning, over 50,000 children are on the streets below 12 years of age? That's just in Sao Paulo, Brazil. See, through the 80s, Brazil had a t suffered the effects of the AIDS epidemic more than many other countries. And many kids were made orphans by that. Then also with the lack of morals, great prostitution took, uh, take, took place in the country. And today, this morning in Brazil, 3.2 million children live in the woods, live on the streets, live in the garbage dumps. So tourists can go up and see the Christ that stands or the beautiful image of Christ over the, over the harbor, Sao Paulo, that the police department, the civic departments go out and clear out the street urchins and children so that they're not seen when, when the tourist boats bring in the guests to go up and get the pictures taken. Did the Christ of that statue know all those little homeless children on the street? In the United States of America, I listened to that lady. I haven't heard much, and I don't know why it caught my attention, of that lady from West Virginia giving her testimony in the Supreme Court of how abortion saved her life so she could have the job and position she has today. And I was sitting there, and did folks just hear what she just said? The judge that granted her an abortion saved her life. Didn't do much for the child. And why I'm saying that is today in the United States of America, one in 30 children will be without a parent, will be without parents. And two, well, let me see, 2.5 million children in the United States of America are homeless. can't figure this. What is man the dark mind for him? I am reminded that God does know. And this great creator who notices every sparrow that falls is taking great notice of every child that goes through St. Jude's. And he's taking care and he's taking notice of every child that's in Sao Paulo, Brazil this morning. Or tonight. And he knows every child in the United States of America today or tonight that doesn't have a mommy and a daddy. Why should I fear? This great creator knows his creation. And to take it a step farther, I have this confidence in the scriptures. Having this confidence we pray, having this confidence, that he heareth us. What is man that thou art mindful of him, that he considers us? How is it that I can pray for a meal and he hears that? How is it I can pray for a job and he, know, he hears that? How is it I can pray for certain clothing or the car to be fixed or a relationship to be straightened out? He hears that. I have this confidence. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name. This mighty one, this powerful one, with works of his fingers created this great universe, and yet he is, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him. Not only, the son of man is the title, it's introduced, we see it in Ezekiel, we see it in the book of Daniel. It is a title for one who's someone who's born unto humanity or born unto man or born unto Adam. We could say it of all humanity that we're the sons of men or, you know, and daughters of men. But specifically, it became the title of one. 
over 80 times in the New Testament, specifically in the book of Mark, Jesus is called the Son of Man. He actually used that title himself when he said, I, the Son of Man, a son of Adam. When I read in Hebrews 2, verses 15, like we did on Wednesday night, or go to Hebrews chapter 4 and verses 14 and 15, when we read, let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, why can we, therefore, what is precedent of that verse that we can come boldly to the throne of grace? Because the preceding verses and actually chapters deal with it, that he took upon the form of humanity and was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sins. Therefore, he understands us. He comprehends us. Let us, therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace. We have an intercessory. We have an emissary, we might say, that stands between us and God. Someone who knows God, someone who knows us. What is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man, humanity, that you paid us a visit? I don't claim to comprehend it, but I have kind of an idea. Galatians chapter 4. Galatians 4 and verse 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law. What a topic that is at Christmas in the fullness of time. To redeem them that are, why did he come? To redeem them that are under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Watch. It's adoptions used in this passage, in this chapter, as a legal term, a legal term of choice. God sent forth his son in the fullness or the completeness of time, made unto man, made under the law. Walked in the same form, under the same system as us. What? To redeem them which are under the law. And the law which found us guilty and condemned. Condemned already. That he might, as he says, give us the adoption of son. Because he said, because I choose you. And I want to legally make you mine. I keep reading. It says this. And because your sons, legally his... Because you are sons, um, verse 6, right, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit of Son. I send you another comforter. Into your hearts crying, my Father. Little kid gets adopted in the family, and maybe for a while, depending on their age, they don't fully comprehend what's happened. I don't know what age I can even use, but maybe if they're a little bit older that they didn't realize from the bad situation they came out, the rejection they came out of, the poor treatment they came out, and sometimes so abusive. And then all of a sudden, someone came along and said, I want you to be part of my family. I'm going down the courthouse under the law and make it so. When does it cross their mind from what I had to what I've got now? And maybe it's a wealthier family. I think of the family, the fellow that owns the Orlando a magic, how they brought in their family, I think adopted like 19 kids or something like that. But all of a sudden they realized, I went from poverty and I went from abuse and I went from rejection to now I belong. And when do they finally sit down, look across the table and say, that's my daddy. That's my father. And we realize that in full time of time, God, God instituted the legal program to say, I'm adopting you to redeem us, but I'm adopting you, making it official, make legal for you to be my children. My Father. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's personal. We belong to a family. And the Son, how is all this possible? Verse number seven. Um, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. They come back. Because the son of man visited the sons of men. Because we can be born into his family by the Holy Spirit. Because we can be chosen and adopted into the family of God. 
Because the Holy Spirit now indwells in us, who's now in you, and declaring we belong, and praying for us. We, Lord will on Wednesday night get on that. Uh, communicating with us, instructing with us, we are the heirs of God through Christ. John Newton kind of got an idea of what was taking place of Psalms 8. Because in his own life, he knew what it was like to be a despicable person. Yes, he was involved in slave trade work out of Africa. He himself had been captured and was a slave for a while. He knows what it's like to, instead of being caught by authorities, to send slaves to their death. He knows what it was like to be a drunkard on the streets. He knows what it's like to hear someone give a gospel message that Jesus saves and is able to forgive us from all unrighteousness. And he knew what with a simple prayer to ask the Lord to save him and then pen the words, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Do you wonder how many people sing and know that song and don't even know what they're singing because they haven't given it careful consideration? How great God is, how insignificant man is, how benevolent God was to man to save him. Realizing in more recent times, John Peterson, he actually has a song or two in our hymn book. I think that one of them is Heaven Came Down. So John Peterson is more contemporary to our age. He passed away rather recently, but. He wrote, what grace is this that brought my Savior down? Great, great Christmas cantata. That made him leave his heavenly throne and crown. What grace is this? Just another way of saying, when I consider the moon and stars, the works of thy fingers, what is man that thou art mindful of him? The son of man that thou visitest him. I am closing giving consideration. Matthew chapter 18 that we can be the heirs of God, Matthew chapter 18, verse 3. Psalms chapter 2 had that passage after the introduction, bookends of introduction, how magnificent is your name. It said, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength. Children to get praise. That's the one verse that's quoted in the New Testament in the book of Matthew where Jesus rode triumphantly into Jerusalem. And after coming in and people praising him on the way, Pharisees say, don't have him do that. Jesus said, if they don't, the rocks cry out. Then he comes into the temple. And while he's in the temple, the children begin to cry out and say, Hosanna. They're saying, Messiah. They're saying, Lord, save now. They're recognizing me as the Messiah. They're recognizing me as Lord. They're crying out, Hosanna, save us now. Matthew chapter 18, verse 3. And said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. How great God is. How insignificant man is. How benevolent is Christ to span that gap. That a little child, I don't know how old this child was here. Was he a three-year-old? Was he a four or five-year-old that Jesus sat in the midst and gave this lesson? How old were those children in chapter 21 who in the temple said... Jesus, Hosanna, save us now. And Jesus says, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected ordained praise. How in the world could this great God come to this insignificant, sinful being and make it this simple for me to be in his family? He didn't ask for me if a million dollars or folks in my lifetime, I'm not, I'm not making it. 
He didn't ask of me to fillet my body as tradition in the Philippine Islands or Papua New Guinea. He didn't ask me to crawl on my knees to Mecca or to Rome. He didn't ask me to keep all the Ten Commandments every day of my life from sunrise to sunset. He didn't ask me to attend church for X amount of times, whether it be 30,000 times or 10,000. He didn't ask any of that of me. He said, humble myself. Realize who I am. Realize what he's done. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He made it so simple to become part of his family. And I give some consideration to that. I'm going to end with where it said, how excellent is thy name. You are a great God. Somewhere along the day, he said something about the leaves maybe getting past their peak or I don't know. Maybe some places they're still heading there. But when I see the beauty of creation, I'm amazed. When I see the beauty of the, of the redemption that this great God of glory provided through Jesus Christ, a way for me to become his child and made it so simple, I'm considering that amazing. How about you? Let's close with a word of prayer. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, now I'm found. T'was blind, but now I see. Heavenly Father, thank you for a good day to be in your house. May we be amazed at God. May be amazed of his great plan of redemption, that he is mindful of us. Bless in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to stand and sing. Close. Thank you.